welcome back to We Heart Therapy. You're watching EFT Talk. I'm your host, Annabelle Bugatti, licensed marriage and family therapist and certified emotionally focused couples therapist. And we have a very special guest today. We have Dr. Katherine Ream. She's the director of the Washington Baltimore Center for Emotionally Focused Therapy. Mm -hmm. She's also a trainer and supervisor with EFT. And she travels the nation, well, the globe actually, and offers trainings for EFT. And today we're honored to have her and we're gonna talk about withdrawal re-engagement. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Katherine Ream, for being part of our series. Thank you for having me. I super appreciate the invitation. Excellent. Thank you just so much for being here. And so you special, it seems like you sort of specialize in withdrawal re-engagement. And for those who missed the summit, they missed this wonderful presentation that you mm. had about withdrawal re-engagement. And, you know, it brings to light a lot of um, trouble spots for therapists when they are trying mm -hmm. to re-engage a withdrawer. So maybe you can sort of give us a little introduction about during which parts of the steps and stages of EFT are we focusing on withdrawal re-engagement and how mm -hmm. will we know when they're re-engaged? Yeah, good questions, Annabelle. Um, withdrawal re-engagement is the first change event of stage two. So after you've worked through the steps of stage one and your couples de-escalated, we want to help the withdrawing partner from an adult attachment standpoint, the one who avoids their and their loved one's emotional experiences, attachment needs, fears, and longings. We want to help that person, the avoider, the withdrawer, make friends with their inner world. Because emotion is the messenger of love, we have to help each partner get to know their inner world, distill it a bit, and then enact it or share it with their partner. We want to help make bits and parts of their inner world relational. So that... It sounds like, so with drawers, you know, they avoid emotional connection, not only with their partner, but oftentimes with themselves. Oh, I think first and foremost with themselves. The whole, right, the whole, remember the whole thing about attachment styles is their coping strategies. And so how do I deactivate my own attachment needs, fears, and longings? How do I minimize my own emotion that's coming alive inside of me? And that's when the avoidance starts. That's a really great way to say that. That's really beautiful to say, how do I minimize or deactivate the emotions that come alive in me? I, I love that. That's almost like a great way to pose that to the actual clients when you're trying to go on the you know, the primary emotion excavation, <laughs> you know, so how do you regulate this? How do you deactivate them when they come up? That's, that's really, really a beautiful way to say that. And so part of withdrawal re-engagement is we're looking to help the withdrawer make friends with their inner world. I love how you say make friends with their inner world. So then it's not so scary for them to feel their own emotions, but then also for them to feel safe sharing that with their partner. Cause oftentimes it's the lack of any emotional signals or sharing that is so scary for their partner. They just want to know, Hey, where are you? What are you doing? What's going on in your world? They long to know that they're included somehow. Yeah, exactly. We, I used to say you have this amazing privilege to send an emotional ping to your partner. And now I say, not only do you have this amazing privilege, but you have this responsibility. It's a requirement. The neuroscience is really clear these days that we have to help you send an emotional signal of some sort to work on your relationship's behalf, to strengthen your relationship, to create bonding moments for the two of you. Um, so it's, it is a privilege for sure, but it's also more and more clear that partners have to mm -hmm. send a ping, send a crumb, send some kind of signal to their loved one. Um, otherwise, as we know, the lack of signal right. is the ultimate threat in an attachment relationship or maybe even the death of an attachment relationship or the death of a love relationship because without any emotional signal, the partner's left in the dark and that's, that's just not viable for long. Absolutely. And you mentioned several very important things right there. So I'm going to slow it down a little bit and tease apart sure. some of these things. So do you actually tell the clients that 
uh, not only is it important, but it is the responsibility. Do you? I do say you it just like I said it to you. I say it to them, and we really want them to know. You know, because we're experiential in our EFT, and that's bottom up. But all humans need to know what's around the next corner from a top-down perspective. I really want them to know some of the rationale, some of the education about why we work in the ways we work. Why, uh, my, why am I interested in helping them befriend their inner world? Mm -hmm. Especially for a withdrawer who has gotten through life just fine without befriending their inner world. And in fact, befriending their inner world can actually feel dangerous, certainly risky, maybe even dangerous. Yes. And I'm good. Remember, um, withdrawers view of self as positive. Mm -hmm. Like I'm good. Mm -hmm. I don't need to be here. I don't, I'm only here because my partner dragged me here or begged me to come or pleaded. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, yes, we want them to know why sharing part of their inner world with their loved one will help their relationship. And do they ever sort of like have a negative reaction to the word responsibility? Some do. Um, some do for sure. And it's a word, it's a word like I use, as I said, I use privilege all the time. And then I added responsibility or even requirement. It depends. Um, you know, and I'm always watching people's reactions to my words I put forth. Mm -hmm. um, but more and more, I believe that that responsibility is there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, right. I'm not doubting that it's there. I'm just wondering. Yeah. When you share oh, yeah. it, if they have a negative reaction, how might you sort of address that with them if they freak out like, oh my God, I have this responsibility. Yeah, see what's lovely in EFT is if and when they have a negative reaction or there's any sort of freak out in any way, shape or form or avoidance right then or any defensiveness, we just go right in intrapsychically and work on step three or work on step five. And even in talking process with the client or even going meta with the client, you'll get data about their inner world that then you can either use to access intrapsychically in the moment or tuck away for the next time you're ready to work intrapsychically or needing to work intrapsychically and recall it or bring the client back to that moment. Right. And so, I like keep bringing back to the intrapsychic because I find with a lot of therapists who don't understand EFT, they think that we only work with emotions and that we leave thoughts completely out of it. But thoughts are very important because they're sort of a carrier of the emotional message that's going to be underlying, right? If that's your belief, yeah. then of course this emotional reaction is going to make sense. Yes, exactly. Um, you know, the same when you talk about thoughts, I also, my mind included behaviors. Of course, mm -hmm. you know, the emotion drives behavior and we all make thoughts. We have perceptions about ourselves and others. We have attributions. We make meaning. Right. Humans are meaning-making machines, and we make meaning so quickly, often to our detriment or to our partner's detriment. Yes. And so I'm, I feel like EFT therapists are in the business of creating safety mm -hmm. to make space for people's emotion. And let's give space for the emotion to let the emotion do its job and then see what the behaviors are and see what the thoughts are, see what the meaning is. Right. And when you say bottom up, which is a word we use in EFT a lot, but for those who might not be as familiar who are just learning EFT, by bottom up, and, and help me if I'm getting this right, is really working from the emotions first, going from the emotions up through to the thoughts rather than from the thoughts down into the emotions. Yeah, that's, you have a nice way of reflecting that. Um, it's akin to how our nervous systems are constantly evaluating our safety in our world. So we, you know, there's a reality to a visceral sense. And from Steve Porges' polyvagal theories perspective, 80% of that information of that data is going up from the gut mm -hmm. up to the brain. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we want to help our clients. This is how, you know, we know we have to work experientially in order for the change to last. Right. So but then, oftentimes when you hear the client say, oh, I get this knotted feeling in my stomach or my gut, that's their neurological system. They're making an appraisal of what's going on and you're going to go in right there. Right. And we're going to slow down and make space for the knot in the gut. That's excellent. That's excellent. And see, go ahead. 
And well, and see what emotion emerges from that knot in the gut and focusing on the knot in the gut, if we need to go a little bit more meta, how is it, how would it be to linger with the knot in the gut or to pay attention to it and lean into it? Mm -hmm. um, because of course, when we go back to specifically working with withdrawers, that's the exact sensation that they habitually avoid. Yes. Yes, because it's so uncomfortable and so painful to feel. And we just and so, validate, validate. <laughs> right. It's just plain inconvenient, right? It's, yes. you know, it goes counter to their entire coping strategy and yeah. slows them down and gets in their way. And then, of course, it's certainly uncomfortable and painful. I'm so glad that you say that because I have so many clients that are the just be positive, mm. you know, it doesn't like, what good does it do to have these emotions? I, mm. I actually have a couple right now exactly like that. Their life is so fast paced that they don't have time to slow down and experience their emotions because they feel like, okay, it's going to take so much time out of our day. We're just going to feel bad. And then, you know, like, I, I get the sense they feel like they're going to be stuck there and it's going to completely yeah. be like ruin their day. And, yeah. you know, um, yeah. so, so how would you sort of explain that? A little yeah, bit? I, I totally get the inconvenient factor and that it does require time and attention to slow down and pay attention in a new way, whether that's a new way of learning a new skill or mm -hmm. learning to pay attention to our own inner worlds. The hard part, though, is we can't get around the reality that unprocessed pain and fear tweak behaviors. Mm -hmm. And unprocessed pain and fear tweak behaviors, which scramble the signals between people who love each other, which puts them in an escalated pattern. Yes. Oh, and you, so, you say that so wonderfully. It's just like uh, so easy. <sighs> right. And so the, the steps are all there. The connections are made. They're in distress. Neither of them are getting what their attachment needs, fears, and longings are, or what, you know, what they long for. And so we have to back out of the distress. And yes, it's uncomfortable. It's inconvenient. It does take time. And often things will feel more messy before they feel clearer. And that's, of course, emerging emotion is chaotic, especially for people who aren't used, you know, their windows of tolerance are so narrow. They're not used to making space for the messy emotion. In fact, that's why, that's why we avoid them. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I say to my clients regularly, if there was a different way for me to help you to strengthen your bond, I would do it in a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If, if we could problem solve on content level, I would do it if that worked. If we could talk about facts and logic and help that build a bond between the two of you, trust me, I'd do it. Because I get it. This is foreign. This isn't easy. This is hard. Mm -hmm. But because emotion is the messenger of love and you two love each other, we have to, at least in key relational moments, not all the time, right? Mm -hmm. But in some key relational moments, we have to help you send a clear emotional signal. Yeah. And that's going to soothe you like nothing else does. And then that's the reward. It's risky to change your pattern. It's risky to take the time that you don't feel you have to learn a new way of working with yourself. But the reward is huge. Right. And as far as I'm aware, there's no other way to get that reward except to do the work of befriending your inner world and sharing parts of it with your loved one. Right. And oftentimes what I do with my couples is when they start to get a lot better at, you know, once they've de-escalated and the withdrawers re-engaged and they're starting to be able to work more deeply together, it starts to happen more quickly. And mm -hmm. I'll actually like look at the clock and say, do you guys realize that took you five minutes? Yeah. And see here you thought it was going to, you know, ruin yeah. your day and you'd be stuck in this for hours. And literally yeah. it took you five minutes and you have this stronger connection after you feel like you just accomplished something. And they're like, Oh, okay. Like showing them that actually doing this takes less time than getting stuck in the cycle. Exactly. I've done the same thing. I watch the clock because people, when you're in it, it feels like forever. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to be able to tell them very realistically, that was three minutes. That was five minutes. That was eight minutes. And look at what you were able to do. Mm -hmm. So the, the hard part is that when we deny or suppress or mm -hmm. pretend we don't feel on the inside, intrapsychically, it feels like the emotion gets bigger and amplified and gets more potent. Right. And so the more we deny our felt sense, the stuff we don't want to pay attention to seems to grow. And then we have to work harder to deny it. And right. it, it's such a bind. It's just mm -hmm. such a bind for withdrawers, especially. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I, go ahead. 
No, you're good. Well, sometimes I think in EFT, um, and I said this at the summit, and I, in a way, surprised myself, but I think sometimes withdrawers have the steeper hill to climb mm -hmm. because, you know, they love their partners, but we're asking them to do something that goes so counter to their primary coping strategy. Right. They're not used to sharing their inner world, you know, a lot of times not even just like superficial stuff but then right. we're asking them to go even beyond that and share like the really deep hard scary stuff that they're not used to sharing yes and not that pursuers have it easy by any stretch but right. at least they're just more used to communicating it outwardly exactly and sharing feelings maybe it's a lot of secondary but verbalizing talking through sharing feelings as you say so nicely and so at least we have those basic um, norms for a pursuer to often draw on an EFT but for a withdrawer you know it's as we wonder sometimes so many withdrawers when you ask them what they feel they say I don't know and that's a great one so this is a big place where a lot of therapists get stuck. So when you are doing, I love how you talked about in the summit, how it's sort of a recon mission. Yeah. To get to their primary emotions and you start to dig and you're trying to go in and they say, I don't know. And the yeah. worst part is, you know, I've heard other therapists like Sue say, Oh, so what is it like to not know? And then they'll answer, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what it's like to not know. You know, it's so asking me what it's like when I'm telling you I don't know. So how do you meet the I don't know responses from clients? Yeah, um, first of all, uh, to give credit to my co colleague Marlene Best, who um, gave me the metaphor, the analogy of the recon mission, going on a reconnaissance mission for primary emotions. So that's her, which I really appreciate her sharing that with me. Um, in our stage two trainings. Um, with the I don't know, um, it's interesting. I'm a big fan of the facial expressions giving a signal of some intrapsychic shift. So this is Paul Ekman's research. Mm -hmm. And that the micro muscles in the face give us away. Our faces from his perspective are the emotional truth telling billboard mm -hmm. meant to convey a flurry of signals to ensure our survival. Mm -hmm. And so when a client says to me, I don't know, I'm collecting data about the quality of their voice and the richness or the fullness of their voice, which often is holding emotion, and their nonverbals, whether it's their body movement or their facial expression. And I will reflect, I'll go really soft, slow, and low, which of course in EFT is that risk acronym, repeat, images, soft, slow, simple, and client's words. Right. I'll lean in and I'll go soft, slow, and low, and I'll say, right, it's so hard to know. Nobody's ever helped you know what goes on on the inside. People talk all the time like this is a concept everybody knows. What do you feel? But your coping strategy is to go, no, I don't feel. Feeling is risky. Feeling is dangerous. Feeling is painful. I've, you've spent your whole life with drar organizing yourself not to feel. And so it's even probably very weird for me to ask you what's happening on the inside. Mm -hmm. But as I asked what's happening on the inside, and as you said, I don't know, something, something started moving. Your face, your face gave me a signal. Maybe I heard something in your voice. Maybe I felt something come alive in me. Could I share with you what came alive for me? It was this weightiness. It was this heaviness. That's the dreaded question. Your partner's been asking you that question. That's the dreaded question. So help me know, how would it be for us to linger with the I don't know? And so that's an example of what I might do with a client. Notice how long I talk. Mm -hmm. Notice how soft, slow, and low I go. I'm trying to be as evocative as I can. Notice I use my own experience as a potential conjecture. Mm -hmm. While I'm drawing out with my voice tone evoking as much as I possibly can. Right, right. I love, that is absolutely so fabulous. And I love how you talk about the soft, slow, and low, which is a key technique in EFT. And, and some people are like, why would you want to do that? Well, because if you yes. speak fast and loud, <laughs> you're going to lead them back up into escalation. And yeah. You go up. You, it's sort of like the spiral staircase, and you're going to sort of lead them down one yeah. step at a time. Yeah. Another technique or another reason some of those techniques are some of what I use is I believe the client 
needs the clinician to change levels first. So and when a client says to me, I don't know, that means my intervention hasn't been successful. I'm not saying it's a failure or it's a flop, but it just means I need to help them more. And so I need to be more evocative. I need to change levels with my voice tone, with my wording, with my evoking to get them to follow my lead. Remember how we share the lead with our clients? Mm -hmm. And so if I, if I ask a question, if I'm evoking and a client says, I don't know, then I need to change levels myself to go into the emotion myself, hoping that then I'll have, have macheted a wider, not macheted, um, I'll have, I want to cut a, yeah, cut a path through the growth mm -hmm. that makes it easier for them to follow my lead. And I think you said at the summit, you talked about, you know, leading them into the shallow end of the pool, but they need you to get into the pool first. Exactly. I get into the pool first. That's another metaphor I love talking about. I get into the pool first and I describe what it's like there. Mm -hmm. And then I describe why, we there, why we're there and what it's like and how we get in to touch some things and then we get out and how it helps us when we get out. And so I make it as safe as possible mm -hmm. for them to follow my lead into the pool. Because by getting into the pool first, you know, metaphorically, it's like they don't know what's in the pool, but if they see somebody else is in there, they're not being swallowed alive, there's not all these horrible things going on, then it's a lot safer for them to go in. Whereas if we're asking them to go in first, and they're like, whoa, I don't know what's in here. <laughs> it's really exactly. <laughs> and, and what human, what mammal should, should go into something where they don't know what's there? If they don't know how deep the water is or how the bottom of the water will feel on their feet. Like, it, it, we're, we are risk-adverse creatures, as we should be. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, we, I, I have in my mind all, I love talking about attachment as a theory of threat management and how our fear is our, is our threat signaling system. And so to ask someone to go into an unknown place, like in a pool of emotion, I can imagine it being scary and risky and maybe threatening. And why would I want to go there until somebody that I trust and have some faith in your clinician says, here's why I'm wondering if you could follow my lead. Here's how it will be. And I'll go first and I'll tell you all about it. And I'll slice the risk as thin as I possibly can. Mm -hmm. And you know, what just sort of came up for me as you said that was sort of the counterintuitive nature of our, like our police officers, our emergency medical responders, oftentimes they are withdrawers and you're talking about risk adverse and they're actually trained to sort of override that threat system that says this is scary, dangerous. They're taught to override it and go head first into danger and to be okay with it. But then you get them into our office and we're asking them to go head first into emotion and they're like, whoa, what's that? Mm -hmm. I'll go into a burning building, but I won't mm -hmm. talk about my emotions. <laughs> right, exactly. And that's, that is, I mean, what a, what an amazing, um, I don't know the right, best word right now, but talk about willingness to take a risk. Not only do they find the courage to run into a burning building or other such dangerous environments to protect us, but then they love their partner so much that we ask them to learn about emotional flexibility. And when you're on the job, you suppress all of this to go run into the burning building. But when you're at home, mm -hmm. we want to help you build another another put another tool in your toolbox so that you can be successful with the mission at home mm -hmm. and that requires a different emotional response than it does your other job your other mission yeah that's beautiful i love the way you put that i love the way you put that and i want to bring up something else you mentioned a little bit earlier too that was very important you talked about sending a pain yeah from and you also talked about this at the summit is that we sort of a lot of us can get the belief that we do need to bring them to this really deep place and they always need to share these deep messages. And so they walk away feeling like I need to cry every time. Mm. And you, you really said that's not necessarily the case. Can you tell us a little bit more about what it means to ping or send a crumb? Yeah, we need to help withdrawers make friends, befriend parts of their inner world and enough to send an emotional ping to their partner enough so that they're, 
associating with their inner world, that's from the Klein experiencing scale, that they can be self-descriptive of this place inside, and that emotion is the basic datum of communication. But people can talk about emotion. I, my job is not to make people cry. Mm -hmm. Lots of people do, lots of withdrawers do beautiful EFT and have a great treatment outcome. And crying isn't, isn't the requirement. It's being able to look inside. Sometimes people get water in their eyes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes their voice fills with emotion. Sometimes they feel their lip quiver, um, which are all these amazing signs of beautiful emotion. But it's, it's not about making people cry as a way to make sure they're at a sufficient depth of emotional experiencing, we're listening for their words they use to describe what it is, what it feels like to focus inwardly, what it feels like to go on this reconnaissance mission. What are they finding there? What are we looking at together? How would it be to take a bit of this, talk with me about it for a little bit, and then we'll share, help you share it with your partner? All for the purpose of the relationship's bond being strengthened. We're reminding them of what they long for because sometimes we have to get access to the longings. Yes. But we talk about leveraging the longings um, to help muster courage because the fears are so real and understandable. Right. And I feel like you sort of there just brought it, like pulled in some step four in a way back into this, even though it's stage two in the way that you're again, always circling everything back to the attachment significance and the importance yes. is that the importance of doing this is to strengthen the bond, deepen the bond. Yes. Yes. Right. Especially for withdrawers, many of whom will say or, and or have reported, I'm good with me. I just get these messages that I'm not good in the eyes of my partner. And that's what's a drag. Mm -hmm. And so we frame, could you please consider doing this on your relationship's behalf? Mm -hmm. I know that you don't need to feel more. I know that this is not what you're, you know, that you're dying to get to know your inner world. But you, because you love your partner, we want to help you learn to send an emotional ping. We talk about it as a ping. I like that word. There are many other words. Um, some people don't like ping because it implies that it's like in a sonar sense, it's bouncing off something. But p you send out a ping to then hear and listen, as I understand it, where it bounces off. So where your other person or other sub is. And so you, you're getting a gauge. It's a, it's a, it's a flare. Right. You're lighting up their tower. <laughs> you're lighting up their tower. Yes. And it's, that's the start. It's a signaling system. And that signaling system is enough to get a new pattern going back and forth. And that's why I also talk about a crumb. Like we are not talking about you crying and breaking down and crying regularly and, and, or one many, one big fear of withdrawals is that you want me to turn into a pursuer like my, often like my partner is like, no, 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 no. We just want to help develop a little emotional flexibility for key relational moments. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with how you've coped. It's mm -hmm. serving you well. Mm -hmm. It's just getting obsolete in these key relational moments where you need to share a little bit more of a crumb or a signal. And so sometimes crumb doesn't feel quite right because it's pejorative, like, oh, I just get a crumb. Um, but I somehow want to lower the bar for all my withdrawers right. who are working so hard to do something no one's ever, one, maybe asked of them, but two, never helped them with. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, so that's where I sometimes feel like it's a steeper hill in the EFT. Not, not, an un, not a steeper hill that's not worth climbing, not a hill where the summit is out of reach, but this is where we have to validate the withdrawer incredibly adaptive coping strategy and normalize it mm -hmm. and normalize that what we are asking for is so different. Mm -hmm. And yet here's why it's needed. Right. And can you follow my lead a little bit? Maybe you're borrowing my faith in the process temporarily until you feel the reward. Because I will help your, lots of withdrawers are scared to reach in withdrawer engagement because the last time I tried to share my heart with my partner, she walloped me. And so we often will say the step six of withdrawer engagement with the listening partner is I will help your partner respond in a way that soothes your heart, withdrawer. That's beautiful. Yes. I mean, like really state this very clearly 
for the clients, which I don't think many of us ever really considered in that way. Uh, I have to be transparent because it's, you know, we're, we're a humanistic model, we're experiential, we're egalitarian, we're collaborative. Mm -hmm. I want my clients to know for certain there's no curtain I'm working behind. And that we're in this together, as I've heard Sue so beautifully and lovingly say, we're all turkeys in the same turkey soup. <laughs> and I want my clients to know, like, I think out loud, I struggle, I say, can I take that question back? <laughs> or yeah. that, you know, I, or I, I'm conjecturing, but sometimes my conjectures I'm noticing come out too definitive. And I say, actually, I meant to say that with more tentativeness. Can I, can I try again? Mm -hmm. And people are very gracious and so I liked, I like my clients knowing because of Sue's amazing books and articles and social media and, and just how beautifully she's got, gotten EFT out there. A lot of clients come knowing about EFT, mm -hmm. but I like them session by session to know where we are in the model and what we need from each of them to go to the next place. And, mm -hmm. you know, that a little bit of that top down just to, so they're not preoccupied with what's around the corner. Right. That's how I always try to balance. Of course, we're experiential and bottom up by and large, mm -hmm. but it's some, especially with withdrawers. Mm -hmm. And I wrote an article about this in the networker, maybe May or June of 2012 um, with a combat guy. You have to give some top down mm -hmm. clarity so that their brains aren't preoccupied. So then they can allow you to work bottom up. I have found that to be true with a lot of the super logic, super fast is like, you sort of got to give them a little nugget of logic to hold them in that space so that they don't spend all their energy fixating on that and you can lead them down into the emotions. Beautifully said. A little nugget of logic. I love that. That's exactly what I, you have much better frame for it, but that's exactly what I've tried to do um, to give them an anchor or a handle or some kind of mile marker along the way, but a, a, a nugget of logic is lovely. Yeah, and I love that you say mile marker because as you're explaining, you know, I'm going to help you open up and sort of share this new thing with your partner and I'm going to help your partner be able to sit with this, to be able to accept it in a way that soothes you is so beautiful. You're giving that mile marker right there. Like, this is where we are. This is what we're yeah. going to do. Right, right. And this is, you know, I'll often signal to my withdrawers to end pursuers to both partners um, hey, we're heading out of stage one. You guys are doing really well. You're catching your steps in the dance and you're avoiding the escalations. And I see all these hallmarks for de-escalation. And of course, we're talking about that. And then I'll turn to the withdrawer, say, how would it be to feel me be more focused with you? How would it be for me to linger with you? And lots of withdrawers say, you mean you think there's more there? Or I thought this meant we were almost done. You, there's more work to be done. Mm -hmm. And I, of course, talk about the, you know, I love the heart of stage two, mm -hmm. you know, restructuring their bond. And if we didn't restructure their bond, more, light, more than likely in, in three weeks or three months or three years, they'd get caught back in the cycle again. Right. And then I turn to the pursuer and say, how will it be for me to help your partner share more of his or her inner world? How would it be for me to be working on your behalf, but not working as much with you? Because I want to be very predictive mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that the withdrawer is going to get a lot more of my focus and emphasis, which can make them uncomfortable. Right. And the pursuer could feel left out to dry. Although and usually by the time we get to stage two, where they've de-escalated a little bit, they're, I feel like the a lot of pursuers are very hungry to hear what's inside the yes. are. So they're like, okay, great. If you can help <laughs> yes. them talk to me more, because that's what I've been dying for. <laughs> exactly. Yes. And I think just a little bit of a mile marker, just a little nugget of where we are in the process. And because they often report us we, EFT clinicians, we feel differently at the start of stage two. Because we're no longer so focused on balancing each partner with the interpersonal. Right. We need to go deep. We need to linger longer. We need to block their exits. Mm -hmm. um, that block the exits. So can you talk about that for a second? Sure. That in stage one, we talk about how we, in order to build and maintain an alliance, we follow, again, as we share the lead with our clients, when they exit out of the process in stage one, we often need to follow their exit and then work them back to the process that we're focused on of de-escalation. Mm -hmm. But in stage two, the essence of stage two is focus. And if we don't block their exit, we won't get the traction we need to do this two stage two change events. Now, how do you block the exit? 
Yeah, you say, oh, that's a good question. So let me get more specific. So I'm, let me think of a withdrawer who, um, yeah, we, I, I, one, one person's coming to mind and uh, he'll often go cognitive, use emotional words, but in a cognitive state. Right. And I'll say, I'm doing everything I can to keep your focus inwardly. Could I linger here? Could I ask more about this emotional word you just said? Mm -hmm. How would it be if you and I got into an exchange about, you use the word annihilated. Mm -hmm. And annihilate, big, big word, heavy word, lots in that word. Could I go into annihilated? Do you mind if I interrupt you? and go right in intrapsychically with you. Yeah, okay, so I think I get that. So in stage one, because there's not, a, not as much safety and you're still sort of building rapport and alliance and, and trying to de-escalate, you're gonna follow them through the exit door and try to gently bring them back as yeah. a way to help de-escalate and help build safety. But once you have more of a firm foundation of that, when you get into stage two, it sounds like you're gonna see them starting to head for the exit and you're going to intervene a little bit quicker and not let them go all the way out the door and say, hey, wait, come on back yeah, here. Exactly. You can imagine, which is common for withdrawers, is they find lots of reasons to go to their head because that's where their safety zone has been. And it's unfamiliar to stay in the affect. And so, and I'll sometimes say, because we're getting going and withdraw our engagement, because we're starting the deeper intrapsychic part of the process with you, could I, do you mind, sometimes I say this, I don't always like it when I say it, but could you let me hold your feet to the fire here? Mm -hmm. Could you, could you stay with me? Could we stay right here right now? I know I'm interrupting. I love how you say hold your feet to the fire because I actually use that. When I have really good rapport, I'll say I'm going to yeah. hold your feet to the fire a little bit on this. Yeah, good. And do it. And I've seen yeah. it beautifully. So let's yeah. just stay here. <laughs> right. Lovely. And here's why I need to hold your feet to the fire. We're just on the verge of that leading edge. Mm -hmm. And I, my job, all my interventions at this point are to keep you exploring your leading affective edge. Right. Briere's right. concept. And I like too when you talked about, you know, discuss, sort of discussing or introducing stage two to the clients and they're thinking, wait, wait, wait you mean there's more? Um, I find with a lot of, sometimes the stage two entrance is much more smooth and seamless because once you get them out of de-escalation, they naturally start back into connection. But mm -hmm. then I find with the really rigid couples, the absence of disconnection does not necessarily mean the presence of connection, meaning just because we're not fighting doesn't mean that we're reaching. Yeah, we're exactly. Really close. So I'll tell them yeah. now we're going to work on really now that we're not fighting as much and we're able to get out of these things, we're going to talk about how do we deepen that emotional intimacy, that bond, because when you feel really deeply connected, those moments that you do get caught into the cycle aren't going to feel so threatening to the relationship. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, right. Beautifully said and super relevant for them because as you're saying, the, the escalation is very helpful, but then often for couples who have been really escalated for, for maybe a really long time and have gotten in a real rigid pattern, there are blocks to reaching. There are so many fears of reaching that it feels good not to be escalated, but oh my goodness, it's so risky to imagine reaching that we literally have to talk about and process fears of reaching, fears of going deeper fears of trying to restructure their bond, which is risky for both partners. And sometimes I'll track this as sort of like a more subtle form of their cycle. I'll mm -hmm. say, look, you know, this is a more subtle way that your cycle shows up and look at how we get caught not reaching for each other and how we mm. miss these moments of really going deep. And a lot of times you'll hear them say, I really want this deep emotional connection with my partner. And they don't know what emotional inti intimacy looks like, but they know they want it. And so in those moments, especially with withdrawers, where they're like, why, you know, again, why is it so important to share my inner world? I, I talk about, and I think I actually recently just borrowed this from you after I saw you at the summit, you know, is that this is sacred space. You know, yeah. here you are opening up and sharing something with your partner that you don't share with everybody else. This is right. so 
special and so sacred. And this yep. is intimate right here, right now, you're practicing emotional intimacy. Beautiful. And I'll turn to their partner and say, how does it feel to have this emotional intimacy with your partner? And they're like, oh my God, I love this so much. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And when I Lovely. say, this yeah. is emotional intimacy, then they're like, Oh, okay. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah. You're doing it now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's great. The word sacred, that sacred space, that this is what you do with very one other person on the planet, maybe another uh, for different reasons at some point, but right. This sacred is, it makes what we do like just so amazing that we have this honor and privilege to help couples find the sacredness between them again, or maybe for the first time. It really is so rewarding. It's so rewarding when you see them, you know, and for some couples that have been super rigid, you feel like they've been walking through like the Sahara desert and they're so mm -hmm. parched. And when you see them get that first drink, you know, of water, they feel so refreshed. It's so deep and profound. I tell you, those moments are better than any romantic comedy <laughs> you could right. ever see. It's like, oh right. my gosh, grab the tissues. This is so beautiful. <laughs> right. <laughs> better than the notebook. <laughs> <laughs> right. The ultimate romantic comedy. Yes, 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 uh -huh. yes, yes, yes. So, so thank you so much again for being a part of our series, for talking about withdrawal re-engagement. Now, I know you specialize in this. You offer trainings. You have a video that's available. Yeah. It's a, a two-part video, actually, for um, the first five sessions and then the second set of sessions. Where can folks find your videos? Yeah, thank you for asking. Um, these videos are of one couple's, a real couple's journey through stage two. So it's a female withdrawer with a male pursuer. And so the first package is her withdrawal engagement. Mm -hmm. And the second package is his softening. And so I'm super honored that the couple consented and agreed for me to share their work. Um, and you can go to my website, which is the Washington Baltimore Center for EFT dot com wbc eft dot com to learn more about accessing the videos to become a subscriber to stream them excellent and and we're going to put a link in the description for the video and they are excellent videos i've actually um got subscribed to them myself and they're beautiful and i love that there are moments where you pop mm -hmm. onto the screen and do a little discussion and you say yeah. look I'm not perfect. Now that I watch this, I could have done this. I could have done that. You know, it's just so like normalizing and it's like, oh, yeah. even this awesome trainer still, like, oh. you know, so it's oh so my. beautiful. Well, thank you for watching and thank you for reflecting those lovely sentiments. I, I mean, I still cringe and I've watched these videos so many times in the production of them and the labeling of the interventions and adding in these exercises, but it's so helpful to, I'm constantly teaching myself. Mm -hmm. and learning and and I hope we all constantly remain students of the model and let our couples teach us absolutely absolutely but the amazing thing you know it's just so validating for us as therapists because you know honestly you guys as trainers are rock stars and we think oh. gosh it just comes off smooth as butter for them are we ever mm. going to get that good do they ever get stuck do they ever you know like mm. kick themselves like man i should have done that so to hear you talk about that's just so validating for our own experiences so thank you so much <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you for this invitation to chat with you today and for watching the videos and sharing with your listeners that the videos are available on my website course anytime guys make sure that you check out her center as i said we're going to put the link in the description for the video if you haven't seen her videos on withdrawal re-engagement please check them out subscribe they are amazing and so helpful and so again thank you so much for being a part of our series and thank you again to all of our viewers for watching eft talk make sure that you hit subscribe because more videos are on the way thank you Thank you.